Hello and welcome to Meet the Masters, the future of biologging with Dr. Akinori Takahashi and Dr. Stephen Vodier. My name is Amanda Gladix. I'm a faculty research assistant at Oregon State University on the U.S. West Coast and I'm the co-organizer of this series and I will be acting as the host of this conversation. Um, Meet the Masters is a series of question and answer sessions, conversations between early career seabird scientists and their more senior counterparts. And this is the third of six conversations scheduled in advance of the second World Seabird Conference um, that's happening in October of 2015 in Cape Town, South Africa. Hi, uh, my name is Schurer Hammer and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, I'm also a co-organizer of uh, the series and I'll be handling the, the questions from our online audience today. Uh, you can join the conversation by tweeting your questions uh, uh, or, using, or yeah, comment on, on, on content um, using the hashtag MTMSC on Twitter uh, and posting the comments section of the Google Plus events page and on the broadcast page on YouTube. Okay, so um, before we dive in, I want to mention that folks have just over two weeks before the deadline for early registration for World Seabird Conference, and that's the deadline is on May 31st of 2015. So while you're getting your um, registration in, be sure to check out um, some of the other early career initiatives that are happening in Cape Town. Um, the Early Career Scientist Committee is organizing a workshop called Engaging Early Career Scientists that will be happening on October 28th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Uh, with five expert panelists to answer your questions about career and professional development. Following that workshop, there's going to be a speedy seabird social, which is a speed dating style social with 10 seabird experts, refreshments, and the chance to chat up some of the leaders in our field. Okay, so today um, we're very excited to have two of the world's experts in seabird biologging, Dr. Akinori Takahashi and Dr. Stephen Vodier. So um, as a brief introduction, um, Dr. Takahashi is an associate professor of animal ecology in the biosciences group at the National Institute of Polar Research in Tokyo. He earned his PhD in 2001 from the Graduate University for Advanced Studies, Sokendai, part of the National Graduate University of Japan. In his current role, he is involved in research and teaching on the behavior and ecology of large upper trophic level predators in marine ecosystems. In order to overcome the challenges of direct observations of large animal movements at sea, his research group has developed novel biologging instruments to obtain detailed information of their behavior. Using these animal-borne instruments and cameras, Takahashi-san studies the survival strategies of polar marine animals and their responses to recent environmental change. According to ResearchGate, he has published nearly 70 publications and that have been cited close to a thousand times. So we're very grateful, um, Dr. Uh, Akinori, Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward. And sure, do you want to introduce Dr. Vautier? Uh, Dr. Steve Vautier is senior lecturer in natural environment and has dual appointment in the Environment and Sustainability Institute and the Biosciences Department. College of Life uh, and Environmental Sciences at the University of Exeter. He earned, he earned his PhD in 2001 in zoology from the University of Glasgow. In his own words, the aim of his research is to understand the impact of global change on marine top predators. His work is field-based and leverages the recent advance, advances in biologging technologies to understand how key stressors such as fish extraction, climate change, pollution and industrial development have impacts at the individual, population, and community level. Also, according to his ResearchGate profile, he has over 60 publica publications cited over 1,500 times. Thanks, 
Sturgeon, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, and yeah, thanks for inviting me. I feel very masterly today, so that's great. <laughs> excellent, excellent. We're really, really glad to have you. <laughs> we also have a really great group of early career scientists joining us today from um, far-flung corners of the world, um, including the now legendary woman who shared um, this very inspiring Twitter post, which I will share with you now, um, of a gannet landing on her head and making a nest. So, Grace, why don't you start us off um, by introducing yourself? Um, so, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Grace and I just finished my honours degree with Deakin University um, in Melbourne, Australia. And my research was looking at um, foraging behaviour in little penguins. And I'm currently uh, looking for a PhD opportunity for next year. And sometimes gannets land on my head. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Françoise Amelino. Uh, I'm a PhD student in uh, the University of Montpellier, and more precisely in the Center for Evolutionary and Functional Ecology. And I work on little oaks, uh, which is an Arctic seabirds, especially on their sensitivity to climate change. Hi, yeah. Um, I'm Mark Miller. I'm a uh, PhD student over here in Australia. Um, I'm up at James Cook University in Cairns, and I'm studying uh, wedge-tailed shearwaters and how they. Um, forage over the tropical marine environment. Hi, I'm Juliet Lamb. I'm a PhD candidate at Clemson University in South Carolina, which is on the east coast of the United States. Um, I work in the Gulf of Mexico on spatial ecology of brown pelicans with respect to offshore energy development. Um, hello, I'm Saskia Wisniewski. Um, I'm a research master student at University College Cork in Ireland, um, and I'm studying the at sea distribution of multiple seabird species along the west coast in Ireland, and I use different biologging techniques to do so. Great. Well, thanks all of you for being here. Um, let's go ahead and dive into the questions, and I want to start off with kind of a fun question that um, that Francois had about some of the, the surprising things you might find in your research. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask um, how do you deal with huge data sets generated by the new generation of devices uh, such as TDS recording during several months or accelerometers because sometimes it's just impossible to open these files with uh, Excel because they are too big. Um, so I wanted to know how you are doing and maybe we can listen to Akinori's answer first. Okay. Uh, yes, I think I agree uh, it's a very uh, challenging uh, aspect uh, to analyze uh, the biologic data set. And uh, here in Japan, uh, a group of us are using a uh, software called uh, Igor or Igor. Um, and uh, that, that is a, like a uh, time series analysis software. And uh, we de developed uh, some code uh, to analyze uh, regular uh, like PDR or accelerometer data. And, um, Encourage uh, developed uh, uh, um, like a procedure uh, called uh, esographer in the in the IGO, and uh, that is a very useful uh, software uh, to analyze uh, accelerometers. And um, it is uh, open open source. So um, if you Google uh, esographer, uh, there's a uh, download page and uh, uh, the page six are uh, explained. And um, uh, yeah, there's a paper by him, uh, uh, Kentaro Sakamoto. He, he has a paper on, uh, about the esographer program uh, in Plus One. And um, uh, the basic uh, analysis way is uh, explained in the papers. And 
think that that would be a very useful tool, uh, and uh, we heavily using a sort of uh, to analyze the data. Thanks. That's a great um, great tip, and we will um, put the links to those to that paper and um, and that that program up on the Google Plus page and in the comments on YouTube after the broadcast. Dr. Godier, do you want to, or Steve, do you want to address that question as well? Um, I, I think the key thing is probably not to be working with Excel, and that's the first thing to say. It's just not particularly versatile for these kind of approaches, and, and certainly I would recommend something like MATLAB or, or R. It just gives you much more flexibility dealing with those large data sets. But I think another, another key point really is I think it's about being very directed in terms of the questions that you want to be addressing. And now, in some instances, that might require long term or, or, or long durations of, of TDR or accelerometry data. But by and large, I think one would try and be quite targeted. So you're not left with a situation where you have lots and lots of data that you have to somehow manage and handle and kind of trawl through. So I think it's always it's always good to be strategic and to really target your questions. So you you kind of effectively minimize those problems of having massive data sets that you have to deal with. And, and one final point, which is something that's increasingly becoming an issue with biologging data, is just actually where you store it. Um, I think most people would, when we budget for hardware, we think about the devices, um, we might think about um, paying for software to handle it, but well, certainly for myself, I've learned the, the hard way that I didn't budget for appropriate storage. So you create all these files and then you find that you're filling up terabytes of data here, there and everywhere. So actually, I think from the start, budgeting for some decent storage, whether it be on a cloud somewhere or whether it be on, a, on some, some hardware, I think is a good strategy. Thank you very much for all your answers. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. great. So let's go over to Mark next. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I guess this one goes to Akinori first. Um, but I was wondering about um, if sort of GPS and video biologging are really the future of um, biologging as we see it. Um, I know both of you guys have used um, video. Uh, cameras in uh, linked with GPS in your studies, and um, if you could give us an idea as to uh, some of the strengths of the technique and also maybe some of the limitations. Yeah, so I think um, uh, uh, Steve made a good uh, point about the uh, target uh, your questions, and if I think first thing you have to think about if if uh, you know GPS video uh, by logging has uh, advantage for to answer your question. That that is a I think uh, bottom line. And um, yes, by logging can produce uh, lots of information about uh, the uh, environment uh, of the surrounding the birds. And uh, I think video has a strength. Uh, you can directly uh, observe the surrounding of the birds, and you know if birds are uh, uh, approaching to the fishing vessel or uh, catching uh, fish or uh, whale, uh, that kind of information cannot be get uh, without uh, uh, visual information. So that's a clear trend. But the limitation is uh, you tend to have only small numbers of the target birds, so the sample size is an issue, and uh, I think um, even recent uh, cameras, the, the recording duration is limited up to a few hours, so uh, to be ecologically meaningful information, uh, the, the time duration to be a uh, major limitation factor uh, at the moment. What do you think, Steve? So, 
Yeah, Mark. I mean, whether it's whether it's the the future of biologging, I don't know. But I mean, it's it's clear that people are are going to be using these techniques in the future, and and particularly as devices become smaller and and importantly become cheaper. I think that's really really changed the changed the landscape really. Um, I think the, the the strengths there, Akinori has, I think, summarised them really nicely. It's about um, enabling to, to you to get an unusual or a, a, a previously unable uh, view of the environment that these these animals operate in. But I think particularly things like social interactions are really key. Um, we know that that social dynamics have all sorts of implications, both in terms of um, coloniality, in terms of foraging, um, and various other things. Uh, and, and the weaknesses again, I think Akinori has, has summarised those those quite nicely. But I think the, and I guess we'll talk about this more later on. But device effects are something we need to be quite mindful of. The, the cameras are getting smaller. Um, however, there there are still there's still a the potential there for, for device effects and and these kind of limitations of, of capacity. So that sometimes we use cameras and we might see only a snapshot of of a of a foraging trip or or, or, or a, or an animal's life, and I think if we can extend that, I think that would be quite a quite an important goal, really. And we might want to think about the the way in which we we use the cameras to extract information as well. So, for example, do we use moving footage, or can we make use of stills in a in an effective way? Um, and and I think a final limitation is I've done it myself. I've referred to things as being a bird's eye view, but actually that's that's a slight conceit, really, because you don't really get a bird's eye view. It's a very narrow view, and in some cases, you might be looking backwards, or you might be looking forwards, or to the side. And actually, the way in which these animals um, uh, assimilate information from their environment is actually quite complex. So we see a very narrow view of that. So this, not to say that there's we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but there are these limitations that we just need to be mindful of. Sure. Well, thanks very much, both of you. That's really interesting. Yeah, you bring up a great point of we really have um, fairly limited information about what these birds are perceiving, and a camera's view of it is going to be a narrow, narrow version of that. Um, so let's go over to Saskia for the next question. So my question basically goes a little bit in the same direction. Um, it's not necessarily aiming at ca cameras, but I was just wondering, if we could already think about GPS tracking technologies, during the last decades they were like a really big thing and we got a lot of information, insights about the ecology and behavior of seabirds from them. Do you think, like, what do you think is the upcoming next biologging breakthrough? Like, is it cameras or is there maybe something else? Shall we go to Steve first for this one? Oh yeah, I think that's good. All right, thanks. Yeah, I was I was feeling left out. No, um, yeah, good, Saskia, good question. Uh, I think to me, there's there's two areas that that are, that are quite exciting. Um, I think the first one is actually just the scope of the application of GPS. So so moving away from single site, single species studies, um, we now have quite a lot of multi multi-population studies, which I think is being incredibly revealing. But moreover, there's some people moving towards kind of almost a, a community or an assemblage level approach, so tracking multiple taxa simultaneously. And, and we can start addressing some really interesting questions there about niche partitioning and uh, and, uh, and in, inter as well as intraspecific interactions, which I think is quite exciting. So it's really an application of the, of the same technique as GPS become cheaper and, and, and more tractable to deploy. But I think in terms of a, of a perhaps a technological development, I wonder if one of the things that we we haven't done very well so far is, is using loggers that record sound, um, particularly for animals that you could use it for, for social interactions. Um, of course, it has whether it's any better than using using videos, I don't know, because there's all sorts of constraints and limitations there. But I, there is the capacity there, for example, to look at social interactions based upon acoustics, um, and, and I think that could be that could be quite an interesting development. Um, I don't, but I don't know what what do you think, Akinori? No, I think I, I agree. Uh, 
uh, with, with your view on the sound and the like a more well better better use of the uh, uh, multi like a GPS data set uh, like from individual level to the uh, maybe population level or even you know community level uh, uh, from the like a different species uh, at one location at the same time. Yeah, that's a really uh, exciting uh, uh, approach uh, into the future. And uh, yeah, I, I can maybe add uh, some uh, technological aspects uh, I, I think uh, might be uh, important is uh, to, to is, uh, like a remote, uh, remote control device or remote uh, downloading of data. Uh, because uh, the, for the biologging, uh, we need to retrieve devices. Uh, we often need to retrieve devices uh, to get data, and uh, that's um, that's uh, constraining. So uh, uh, if we could get uh, like a biologging data uh, like through satellites or or uh, like a, from the remote uh, base station, um, that would be. Uh, very useful, and uh, uh, in the marine mammal communities, uh, this, uh, they have started to use uh, like a satellite related data logs um, now. But the device is not small uh, enough yet for seabirds, and I think I think that will be uh, one direction our community uh, would like to uh, pursue. Yeah, I think that about it. And may maybe I can comment on the like a, uh, probably more uh, smart tag. So like a, we we record uh, accelerometers, uh, low low uh, recording of accelerometers, the acceleration on accelerometers. But uh, in the analysis, we tend to uh, not use all the low uh, information. So if we can. Um, Process data within the data loader and to record uh, the information we only needed. For example, like a number of feeding uh, events uh, by penguins, then we can extend the uh, length of uh, acceleration application uh, uh, to much longer time scale. And that, that's uh, another aspect I think uh, we we could uh, develop and do uh, that. Add uh, current biology. All right, thank you very much. Really interesting insights. I really didn't think about sound so much, but that that sounds like a really interesting aspect. Um, yeah, thank you for your answers. Great. Yeah, let's go on to Grace. Let's let's go with your first question. Cool. Um, so this is a question for Steve. Um, do you think a reduction in bycatch and discards would be a good thing for seabirds such as gannets, seeing as it makes up a large part of their diet? Um, thanks, Grace. Good question. Um, yeah, I'm not sure whether it's going to influence their choice of nesting location, but you might want to watch out for that one. Um, I, I, I think, it, I, I don't know really. I've, I've thought about this long and hard. I mean, I, I think clearly dumping huge amounts of perfectly usable um, marine protein over the side of fishing boats is not sustainable, and, and I think that needs to change. Um, so clearly we can't be dumping discards overboard for the benefit of scavenging birds. That would just be a crazy situation when so many people in the world are going hungry. Um, but I think in the short term it probably will have some consequences. I think it's I think it's quite likely. I mean, what what it does, some of the work that I've been involved with, what it does suggest is that those impacts won't be evenly distributed across the population. Some individuals seem to be far more reliant on this subsidy than the, than other individuals. Um, but there's also some 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 questions there about actually whether this represents a, 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 some kind of evolutionary trap or not. We still we still don't really know whether Actually, for example, discards might be relatively low in um, in energy, um, and also we don't know whether they may be enabling some members of the population to to reproduce when they wouldn't normally be able to do this. And then, so actually, what you can have is a 
um, a depression of the mean performance of the population. So, so actually, there could be kind of perversely a situation where where discards have been have been largely negative, but we we just don't really have answers to those questions. So, I don't have a nice straight answer for you, Grace. I'm afraid, um, other than I suspect there could be some issues in the long term. Uh, I these animals are opportunistic by their nature, so you'd imagine in the long term they would be able to cope and, and adapt. Um, but there could be some there could be some marked shifts in in the composition of the of the assemblage, particularly moving away from a certainly in in certain parts of the world the seabird assemblage, which is dominated by these these large generalist scavengers. Cool. Thank you so much for that. All right, I think we'll pass it over to Juliet for your question, your first question. Sure. So my question is, I guess, moving a little bit away from the technical science aspect uh, towards sort of a, a career question. But both of you mentioned um, improving the scope and sort of the, the extent of the biologging that we do. And between uh, doing that and also dealing with technologies that require a lot of different skills. It seems like collaboration is really key moving forward. So I was wondering if you had any insights um, from your work in what makes for a successful collaboration and to what extent you're able to share information among people or what maybe you should keep to yourself. Um, and I guess we can start with uh, Akinori on this one. Yes, I, I think, um, yeah. I, I thought about this question, and uh, I, I don't think I have a very good answer, but I think um, from my experience, if you really wanted to uh, work on you know, certain place, or uh, if you really need uh, some information about analysis, or if you want to use like uh, some of the data robots that somebody developed, uh, if you approach uh, to the people and explain, OK, uh, I need uh, this uh, uh, for you know, this aspect of your project. Then people normally uh, are very happy to uh, share uh, you know, information, or, uh, or uh, you, you can talk about uh, collaborations quite easily. So I think, yeah, for for me, like if if I need to do, uh, then I approach to the people, and normally I get uh, good. Um, yeah, collaboration as a result, um, and I don't think that well, basically there's no no information you you want. Every information you know you can share. Um, yeah, I I don't know. What what do you think, Steve? Um, I I, I agree with you, Akinori. That I think. Um, Collaboration is key here. Um, I think we have to work with people across disciplines, um, whether it be physicists and mathematicians to extract the signal from our data, but, but also I think working with other other areas, so working with oceanographers and fishery scientists and um, and climate scientists who they really know about the environment in which these birds are operating. And I think I think we run the risk of um, Becoming quite inward-looking if we don't speak to these these different um, these different disciplines. I think it's I think it's really really key. And and Julia, I think you make quite a good point about asking the question: What do we what do we give up in terms of our information? How much do we share? I think I think you kind of have to go into it with well, with quite a kind of an honest, um, but also quite can be quite a vulnerable position. I think and just to to be open and be inclusive and say. This is what I have. This is what I'm proposing to do. I think sometimes that can open you up to, um, to to problems, but I think by and large, most people are decent, um, and you'd like to think that that kind of collegiate atmosphere um, and that openness will ultimately reward you. Um, so yeah, I think with that point in mind, I mean, I I, I think working with nice people. Is not to be underestimated. I think you don't want to work with people who are just going to be a pain in your pain in the ass, basically. And it, it, yeah, and I think that's what makes the world go round. That's my kind of slightly um, 
the HBO Noel. There you go. Thanks. That's what I was hoping to hear. So. <laughs> Good. Yeah, that's that's some great advice. Hopefully, yeah, a good a good turn won't go unpunished, right? <laughs> Let's go over to Saskia next. Um, okay, so this question relates maybe a little bit to the collaboration um, aspect um, that we just discussed. So obviously, compared to like traditional approaches in ecology, if you use biologging, um, it has like a really strong technical component and sometimes really complex data outputs. So did you always have an interest in technology, programming, or even physics, or did you develop the skills later on, or do you actually just do it via collaborations? How does that work for you? Um, maybe this is going to um, Steve first again. Thanks, Saskia. Um, so I think my last response is maybe given the game away in that um, I'm not very technical at all. I mean, I find it hard to actually program the um, DVD player. I mean, I sort of I struggle. <laughs> um, so yeah, rather embarrassingly, technically, I'm 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 challenged. Um, so yes, that's why I have to work with other people because otherwise I can't even get these machines to work half the time. So, so yes, uh, no technical skills. Therefore, I rely on really clever people that I work with. <laughs> Appreciate yeah. the honesty. Let's go over to Aki. What do you? What's your approach? Yes. Well, uh, me too. So the, I, I'm not really uh, very much the technical uh, person even now. Uh, um, yeah, I was the last person to use like a mobile phones uh, among my friends, and I, I, yeah, I used to hate uh, those technologies. Uh, but uh, you know, the I think like uh, the interesting data the biologing devices uh, produce. Then uh, yeah, I was I wanted to learn uh, about the technology and how, how to use these robots, and so so. Yes, I think I think yes, for me too. The the interest in Shiva's come to the first, and uh, if you need to learn about technology, yeah, you, you can you can learn this thing. Akinori, can I just say I think we um we should have spoken beforehand because I think we've just given the game away there. Um, that was a mistake. <laughs> we should have pretended that we we're absolutely technically gifted. Um, and we can work alone, but never mind. The, the cat is out of the bag, as they say. Yeah, thank you very much for your answers. Um, I'm kind of like trying to figure out at the moment if I want to be the collaborator or the knowledgeable person. Um, I can't really figure it out yet, but yeah, let's see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I have to say it's inspiring for us non-technical people that, that even we can maybe do biologging successfully. <laughs> Great. Let's head over to Mark for the next question. OK. Um, I guess we'll start grilling you guys again for answers now. Um, uh, I was wondering about some of the uh, sort of longer term studies that we need to do. Um, and maybe that in the past, with, I suppose I'm more talking about GPS data here, but um, there's the tendency to collect a few field seasons of data and then start to draw your conclusions. But the longer that we we um, we do these studies, we actually see that there's a lot more variation happening between you know between seasons, between years. Um, and I guess what I was wanting to know is, do you think there's a, an optimal time and an optimal amount of data to collect when you can start drawing your conclusions, or is it just keep on collecting and keep on collecting? And um, yeah, maybe that one goes out to Steve first. I thought I, was, I thought I was going to avoid that slightly tricky question um, first up, but anyway, um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a really I think it's a really good one, Mark. Actually, it's something that I've I've thought about quite a lot, and I and I'm not sure there's a nice convenient answer to it as you might expect. I I think on the one hand, it, I think it's worth noting that that, that people have used biologging across a couple of different seasons, just just two years. It's a really nice study from. Bill Montevecchi and Stefan Garth from from Newfoundland, and, th and there was a there was a massive shift in um, it was essentially a, a regime shift between the two years when they were tracking gannets and 
and they picked up this regime shift in terms of behavior, in terms of foraging, and that was reflected in the underlying oceanography. So sometimes you can just get lucky, right? So you might have these these nonlinear responses. Um, and to, to a certain degree, that doesn't really have a, have a nice kind of um, a time scale along along the axis that you might be looking for. Um, looking at the, the the one third for the birds work, people were looking from the multiple data sets of um, seabird demographics and relating that to the availability of, of forage fishes. Depending on the on, on the maxima of the catch, I think it was between 11 and 13 years was required to actually detect an effect of the availability of forage fish on the on the top predators. Um, so we, we could potentially take that as some kind of exemplar. Um, but it's a bit of an open question. I, I certainly think using biologging in this way is, is a really, I think actually that's one of the one of the next big steps. We perhaps didn't discuss this earlier on, but I, I do think using it as a monitoring tool because of the sensitivity of foraging to environmental change is potentially a lot more sensitive than, for example, reproductive performance or chick condition or something like that. Um, so. My answer to your question is: I think it's really, it's a really important direction. The time scale, I think, is is to a certain extent a little bit unknown. Um, but we could maybe take take the lead from the one third for the birds as that kind of eleven to thirteen years, or maybe we just get lucky and there's a there's a regime shift. Um, so yeah, not a very not a nice black and white answer for you, I'm afraid, Mark. But that's I guess that's because it's a good question, right? It is. What What do you think, Aki? Um, yes, I think it's a, a bit difficult, uh, uh, difficult uh, aspect. And uh, but uh, I think if you if you can maybe um, uh, if you can analyze the, like uh, environmental factors that affecting the, the uh, distribution of birds. Uh, uh, by using habitat modeling or something, then and if you have a good uh, predictive ability uh, from the uh, environmental uh, data set, then uh, you can potentially uh, 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 use all the information to predict uh, the distribution from other years. So I think, um, yeah, if you if you can explain the variation from the set certain environmental parameters, then you might not necessarily need to do the, the uh, need to con continue uh, the tracking uh, over many, many, many years. Um, but uh, on the other hand, as Steve mentioned, the, the uh, like ocean regime shift, uh, those kind of large scale changes in the environment can produce uh, very different Results uh, in terms of uh, habitat shifts. So, so yes, I think uh, long-term uh, biology will be uh, uh, needed uh, uh, to answer uh, such a long-term uh, scale uh, changes in the uh, environment. Yeah, I hope that gives uh, the answer <laughs> to your question, Mark. Yeah, thanks. That's um, yeah, it's really useful. I hadn't thought about uh, some of the the abilities of the habitat modeling. I guess with the really impressive satellite data we've got now and the, the sort of complex algorithms we're using, we can get these habitat models really good. And yeah, and I guess like what Steve was saying with the time that we're even if we do need to do a 10-year study, um, sort of the, how cheaply devices are being made now with um, sort of technology and mobile phone stuff driving it, um, they're actually much more feasible now than they would have been uh, many years ago. So, yeah, thanks very much, guys. Great. Let's um, next go to Grace for the next question. Cool. Um, so my question was, um, what facets of biologging do you think could be improved to further minimize um, disturbance on both the study birds um, and the colony? So for example, do you think we need to develop like better um, device attachment techniques, maybe better um, analysis techniques to get more from our data? 
And let's go to um, Akinori first. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, this, um, yeah, so the, the, I think the bottom line would be the smaller small the, the better. So the, I think um, to make the biologging device small is uh, uh, very important. And, uh, and yes, I, and of course the, the better device attachment techniques uh, uh, is required, um, especially for, I think, long-term long uh, deployments. And uh, well, the people, well, people use uh, geolocators um, by using leg rings, but um, if we are going to use like a solar panel, uh, GPS, or something like that, um, then the uh, leg ring doesn't work uh, for GPS, uh, so um, we better to have uh, uh, to use harnesses or other things, but I, I don't think there's a uh, good established uh, um, Harness attaching method and with and, and well, I th so there's still some need for the the uh, attachment improvement uh, for long term uh, deployment. I think. And another aspect, maybe uh, automatic uh, um, uh, release of like a decoupling data loggers or automatic uh, data download, uh, then we could minimize the, um, uh, the visit, visit to the colony to uh, recapture the birds. And um, that, that would be another uh, aspect uh, we, we may be able to uh, improve in biologing uh, to reduce uh, the disturbance to the colony. Do you have any other thoughts, uh, Steve? Um, uh, I agree with you, Akinori, that size is very important. Um, and also, I think remotely downloadable capacity is, is, is really key here. Um, but I think there's some other areas as well. So I think we need to focus not only on size, but also on the the shape of the logger. Um, we should be aware of things like um, drag and, uh, and and the impact that the device has, how, how the, the weight of the device will change as well depending on the bird's um, life history. So for, for argument's sake, if you have a, a plunge diving animal that, that's organics pull something like six Gs when they hit the water. So you have, you have to multiply up that logger by six to actually work out how heavy it is when it's diving into the water. Now, it might be for a fraction of a second, but for certain species, we need to be cognizant of it's not the weight as we see it. It's, it's, it's not a, a fixed value. Um, also, we need to be cognizant of, of attachment methods. And I think there's some there's some quite interesting developments in, in harnesses. So Sylvie van Dana Beely is working with Rory Wilson. And they're creating these bespoke harnesses really species specific and, and thinking very carefully about how they work and how you attach them. Um, moreover, thinking about device placement as well. So is it important to, to put the device to the center of gravity or where we can attach the device best? There's, there's lots of questions there. And connected with that, I think we need to continue studies that accurately monitor device effects in the short term and the long term, because you can get cumulative effects that in the short term there's maybe no issue, but in the long term becomes much more of an issue. And that needs to be part of our standard practice, I think. I've done it myself. I've said, oh, I've used previous studies published 10 years ago and said, oh, they didn't find an effect, so therefore there isn't one. But I'm not sure that's necessarily defendable now. Um, and the final point, I think, uh, and I think that this, this has come up already, is, is thinking about sample sizes. Um, and, and thinking about how many individuals we need to track to actually derive the metrics we're interested in or answer the questions we're interested in. There's a really nice study that um, uh, John Green's group from Liverpool, they were looking at how many birds they had to track before they actually characterized that population's home range. And those studies are still 
relatively infrequent, I think. Um, so I think it's about good practice across the board, thinking about the devices themselves, the attachment, um, downloading, and, and then also actually just being rigorous and being good scientists, um, which I think most people are, but I think we just need to keep an eye on that. Does it, I don't know, does that answer your, your question, Grace? Yeah, yeah, really good, thanks. Yeah, really good insight from both of you. Great. Let's go on to Francois for the next question. Oh, uh, we got you on mute, I think. Can you turn your microphone on? Sorry. <laughs> That's uh, right. My question was following uh, Mark's previous question, and um, I was uh, wondering, uh, according to you, what is the best way to use biologging in a long-term monitoring program, um, especially if you have a limited budget and in order to to uh, mon monitor any change in the environment uh, due to climate change? Uh, maybe uh, we can ask uh, Steve first. Francois, I think it's a really good question. Um, my initial response is, it is to, to, to question whether biologging is the best technique um, if resources are limited and, and if this is about a long-term monitoring program I think it's, it's quite important to target your questions and decide whether biologging is what you need to use um, and I, I, I think if you decide that that's, that is the, the best approach I, I do think that you should probably use it in tandem with other things I think increasingly we need to be aware of the fact that Biologging doesn't answer all our questions. It's not this; doesn't do everything we wanted to do. So I think when these studies become really powerful is when you have information on distribution and, and behaviour from biologging, and you use it alongside a suite of different things. So by monitoring diet, by monitoring reproductive performance, by monitoring survival probability, and these kind of things, I think then you can really start getting a handle on what's going on. Um, so, so, so yeah, that, that's what I think. But Akinori, what do you, what do you think? Yes, uh, thanks, Steve. I, I think you made a good point uh, about uh, the uh, if the biologing is uh, really uh, needed uh, technique. And to to answer uh, climate change questions, and uh, I think um, maybe for you can do is uh, uh, to combine long-term monitoring program with like a short-term uh, process uh, studies. Um, so, um, for example, if you uh, uh, track uh, 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 birds uh, by GPS uh, biologging uh, for a few years, for two, two three years, then if you know uh, the uh, the distance uh, traveled by birds is uh, linearly related to the trip duration, then you don't need to uh, do the GPS tracking uh, any further, and you can just uh, correct the information on predicting trip duration. Uh, and, or, for example, um, if you know the uh, area of birds uh, uh, is uh, reflected in the like a stable isotope ratios uh, in uh, certain phase or something, then you can monitor uh, uh, only stable isotope uh, for long term. So I think the combination of uh, uh, sh short term like a process uh, study by using biologging and uh, long term uh, program will be a good approach uh, if you. Uh, limited in the uh, budget in the long run. Does it answer your question, Hansel? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point to, to bring it back to things that we can observe more cheaply and um, from the colony as well. Thanks. So let's let's go to um, Juliet for the next question, sort of a change of topic a bit. Yeah, so all of us are just starting out on what we hope will be long careers in seabird research. So I guess I was wondering, as the masters among us, uh, if you have any insights as to common mistakes that you see early career scientists making, either scientifically or professionally, 
and many anything you did early in your careers that you would do differently if you had a chance. So I guess we'll start with Aki Nori. Um, yeah, I, I thought about this one, and maybe uh, um, yeah, for me, um, like uh, lighting papers uh, was a very difficult uh, process, especially in the early uh, stage of my career, and. Uh, um, now I know there's a uh, good uh, book, English book about uh, the lighting, uh, about like a scientific English, and uh, I, if I start again, probably I would uh, uh, read and uh, learn about uh, the scientific writing uh, uh, early in a career before I start writing uh, uh, the first paper. So I think that, that's the, the yeah one thing that uh, came up to my mind. And I'll hand over to Steve. Thanks, Akinori. Um, yeah, I looked at this question, and Julia, I think it's a really good one. But I did I did sit there and stare at it blankly for quite a long time. Um, I. The things that I came up with were, I wonder if early scientists should sometimes slow down a bit. Um, I think you have to have a work ethic. I think it's really critical that you you put in the hours. I don't think there's any getting away from that. But but I think it's also important to have time to, to think quite carefully. Um, that sounds like a, an obvious thing to say. But I, I think careful thought and really working out your questions and how you tackle problems is something that just takes time and, and the other thing to note is that that time to think is it soon disappears in your career um, I you don't get much time to think well I don't anyway these days so, so yeah so I, I mean it sincerely that, that, that think quite carefully about your questions and what you want to do um, in terms of what I would do differently I don't know. I, I never had a plan. I never had any kind of grand scheme. I just kind of went from one thing to the next. Um, here I am. Um, I certainly, I would certainly contest whether I'm a master or not. But anyway, <laughs> that's another matter. Um, I, but I guess what I would do differently, I suppose, is maybe not given up on um, maths and physics quite so early on, so I could actually be. Um, one of those technically gifted people instead of relying on lots of other people to do these the difficult things for me. So actually that's the one thing I would change is a uh, yeah keep be numerate be 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 very very numerate. If you any opportunities to to engage in maths or physics, do it. I think it's really really helpful. And that's that's my one small minor regret. Yeah, hopefully it's not too late for most of us. <laughs> I think it's too late for me, but. <laughs> It may be too late for me. We'll see. <laughs> well, thanks. Great. Those are some great insights and um, good for, for all of us to hear um, as we embark on, yeah, as Julia said, hopefully long careers, all of us. Um, so we, are, um, we have about five minutes left, so I want to work ahead to um, Saskia's question. Um, Go to her. I think we may have just lost Saskia. So let's go to Grace for your question. Um, so am I on? Yeah, cool. Um, so my question is, um, what do you think is the most challenging part of working in a field which is, yeah, constantly developing new techniques and new technology? Uh, let's go to uh, Steve first. Um, Grace, I, for me the biggest challenge is the change in analytical tools, I think. Um, Every time you open a, a publication, somebody has, has explained that this, the way in which we've analysed movement data before is all wrong, and everything you've done is just nonsense. So you have to this, this, this is the new way to do it. And almost every time you open a publication, someone's kind of making these kind of claims. So I find that kind of 
it's exciting that the, the advances in technology, but also it can be quite frustrating. And I think it can be sometimes frustrating when work goes out to review and people, you might use something that was last year was was cutting edge, and now this year it's sort of seen as old hat, and so you get reviewers explaining to you you've done this wrong and you should use these new techniques. So when actually the biological signal's there and actually what you're doing in the first place is probably statistically perfectly appropriate. Um, so yeah, I think that kind of shifting of the goalpost is, can be a little bit a little bit frustrating. Akinoria, what what do you think's the the most frustrating part of? Yeah, I don't have the really, um, good answer. Well, I, I agree uh, entirely uh, with uh, your comments on the analytical aspects uh, developing so fast, and yes, uh, we. I have difficulties in catching up with all the, the advances in the, the analytical tools. And uh, yes, I think <coughs> I think um, yeah. So the, the device uh, getting uh, smaller and smaller. So the, the or like recording duration, for example, videos uh, can get longer and longer. Then you want to keep up with uh, the uh, uh, latest uh, technology to, to minimize uh, the disturbance to the birds or to maximize the uh, data acquisition. So the, in terms of funding wise, like the fact you got like a two years ago, uh, it's, it's not the best technique then uh, you have to uh, uh, yeah, purchase uh, or develop yeah, new ones. Uh, that that is a big challenge in, in terms of uh, funding, and that that's the, the yeah, thing I can maybe add uh, to the Steve's comments. Yeah, cool, great, thank you. Okay, I think we have probably just time for one more question. Do we have any questions from our online audience? No, sorry to say, uh, we don't. So uh, I, I think we should uh, get back to that question we wanted to ask Sas uh, We wanted Saskia to ask. Yeah. yeah, let's. We've got Saskia back with us, so let's let's hand it over to you for the last question. Okay, I'm super sorry for disappearing. I don't actually know what happened. <laughs> um, so I have actually a tricky one as the last one, so I hope it's not going to take too long. Um, but how do you think the recent trend towards biologging and modeling approaches affect the balance between intensely studied areas and species and understudied ones? And does it actually make it harder to start and publish just less sexy baseline research, really? Um. That goes to, yeah, whoever first. <laughs> yeah, I think you can go for it, yeah, Steve. I can't believe you just did that to me. Um, yeah, I I think it's a, it's a good question, and I, and I I have a I sort of struggled over this really. Um, I mean I I think the the um, the point about the balance between intensely studied and, and understudied species is I think it's an issue. So um, typically the the less well studied species will be. Um, Maybe about asking more general questions, whereas I think the the kind of focal species we're now getting to a stage where we can start asking some some quite important biological questions, and I think that's always going to be the way, um, because we have that baseline knowledge that we can that enable us to go quite deep into things, um, and I, I think the point about baseline research, I think it's always been very difficult to publish baseline research. I think typically the scientific community is not very good. Uh, accepting the value of that, or, or, or they accept, accept the value of it as, as a monitoring rather than as a kind of a publication um, arena, um, and I think that's always been that case. So, so I'm not sure that much has changed. So, Saskia, I don't know whether that answers your question at all. However, I'm going to hand back to Akinori, who I'm sure has got a fantastic response to that, nicely prepared. <laughs> no, I um, yeah, I think it's the the 
that there were uh, similar conversation in the uh, uh, previous uh, uh, session on long-term study. And uh, <clears throat> even the long-term study is uh, very uh, powerful, but you still want to have uh, like a uh, uh, study going in other er started in other areas or on a new species. So even though uh, like a heavily studied uh, species and um, uh, more detailed research uh, is leading the research, you still uh, need, we we still need to have uh, like a uh, New, new species or new uh, study sites uh, started. Um, um, yeah, I think even though publishing may be difficult, uh, we, we should uh, keep trying uh, on adding uh, more data on uh, new species or new study sites. Yeah, thank you very much for your answers. Um, for me personally, I think this is like a super difficult question because I'm basically studying a completely new area as well. And um, we don't have any baseline information at all. The only information we really have is tracking data. And that's something I ask myself basically every day. So it's really, it's really nice to get some insights into it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for um, for the excellent questions we had from our early career scientists, and to Aki and Steve for your time and and thoughtfulness in in answering those questions. We really hope this conversation will keep going, um, both online and hopefully in Cape Town as well. Um, I hope all of you guys will be able to make it and see you guys all there. Um, Again, uh, early registration for World Seabird Conference ends on May 31st, so get your registrations in and look for the other early career scientist events at, um, that are happening in Cape Town. I'm sure, do you have anything else we need to mention before we sign off here? So basically, no. <clears throat> We, uh, we plan to have a bit of a summer break and in, in meet the Masters series. Uh, the next one is not scheduled until, is it August? Early August, yeah. But I would like you to still keep an eye out for, for the post because we are uh, currently working on a Meet the Master special uh, about social media, in fact, and, and how uh, I, I'm trying to, uh, to, to get a, a group of uh, social media commandos uh, Together and uh, and to share their wisdom on on the value uh, uh, of of engaging the the public, I suppose, and uh, other scientists on on social media. So, but that's uh, that's not you know it's not scheduled yet, uh, but it's something we we hope to to set up sometime um, in in June or July. Okay, so look for those announcements and. Um we hope to, yeah, continue the conversation and um, see everybody on, in our online audience and have another great group of early career scientists for our conversation with um, Thierry Boulinier and Bill Seideman, um for our August Meet the Masters. So thanks to everybody, and um, we will see you later. Thanks. Thanks a lot.